All right, well, first off, uh, thank you, Joel, for the introduction. Um, also want to thank my mentor, Dr. Saza, as well as Dr. Pena. They both helped me put this together. My topic today is ADHD and veloxazine, which is a new non-stimulant treatment option. Before I get going, uh, required financial disclosure. I have no personal professional financial relationship, which could be perceived as a conflict of interest. This presentation is for educational purposes and no off-label medication use will be discussed today. The objectives I will hit and touch on, what is ADHD, the types of the diagnostics and DSM-5 criteria, a brief history of ADHD, the pathophysiology, symptoms, comorbidities, why we treat, and what are the goals of treatment. I'll look over some screening tools briefly. I'll talk about the traditional treatments available, and I'll go over some veloxazine studies. So the first type of ADHD I want to talk about is predominantly inattentive impulsivity type described as a persistent pattern that interferes with functioning or development. You need six or more of the following for at least six months, and they must negatively impact directly on academic, occupational, social activities. Um, if the patient is older than 17, the criteria is relaxed a bit and you only need five of the following. So the things they really look at are like failure to give close attention, or you make a lot of careless mistakes at school or work, um, difficulty sustaining attention when you're doing these tasks. Sometimes it looks like you're not even paying attention when you're being spoken to directly, trouble following through with instructions, or you may not finish work or tasks on time, uh, difficulty with organizing, uh, you don't like or you're reluctant to engage with tasks that require you to really have a sustained mental effort. You could lose things necessary for task activities. You could be easily di distracted by any kind of extraneous stimuli. And you're just overall forgetful in a lot of your daily activities, chores, errands, uh, making phone calls, paying bills, getting to appointments. Um, second type of ADHD I wanna talk about is hyperactivity type. And the signs and symptoms you wanna look out for, so the patient will interrupt or intrude on others. Um, they'll be really fidgety and squirmy. They'll tap their hands, feet, uh, all kind of always kind of wiggling around. They could get up and leave their seat in spots where remaining seated is expected, such as school. They could run, climb about in inappropriate situations again, like school, uh, unable to play, or engage in leisurely activities quietly. They seem like they're driven by a motor, always moving, always on the go, uh, trouble waiting their turn. They could talk excessively or blurt out answers before the questions is even finished. In addition, there's a few extra conditions that must be met. Um, several of these symptoms must be present prior to age 12. Uh, they have to be present in two or more settings, which could be home, school, work, um, social activities, spending time with friends and relatives. There has to be clear evidence that these symptoms interfere with or reduce the quality of social, academic, or occupational functioning. And these symptoms don't occur exclusively within the course of a schizophrenia or other psychotic disorder, and they are not better explained by another mental disorder. And you can meet criteria for both if you have um, enough for the past six months, in which case you'd be um, diagnosed as mixed type. A brief history of ADHD, kind of discovered in 1798, uh, 1798, there was a Scottish doctor, Sir Alexander Crichton, and he noticed that there was just some folks that were easily distracted and had trouble focusing. In 1902, Sir George Frederick, he had a series of lectures about 15 boys and five girls who had problems with attention, self-control, but they were otherwise healthy, had normal intelligence. In 1932, there were some German doctors, Franz Kramer and Hans Bolnau, and they described hyperkinetic disease, which was described as children that couldn't stay still. In 1937, Charles Bradley, 
He was the medical director at the time of the now Bradley Hospital in Rhode Island, noticed that a stimulant, Benzedrine, caused some children to behave better. Ritalin was first made in 1944 and marketed as such in 1954, and it was used to treat uh, conditions like chronic fatigue and depression. Um, and ADHD was not in the American Psychiatric Association's DSM until its second edition in 1968. And at that time, it was identified as hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. In 1980, with the third edition of the DSM, it was renamed to ADD given two variants with or without hyperactivity. That was, the name was changed to ADHD in 1987. And from 1994 to today, the fourth edition of the DSM and up lists three types. Uh, the three types I kind of briefly went over, inattentive, hyperactive, or combined. There are more than 5 million children between four and 17 in the US, which have it. Uh, boys are more than twice as many cases as girls. From 97 to 99, 7% of all children in this age group were diagnosed or met criteria. And that number rose to 10% from 2012 to 2014. And 4.4% of US adults now reported to have ADHD. 62% of them are men. So this is a fairly busy slide, but I wanted to include it because it's kind of all encompassing. Um, Things I want to point out at the top in these uh, light blue boxes, you have kind of the components that lead to the pathogenesis of ADHD. You have genetics, which is listed as the largest impact, but other things also play a role like premature delivery, um, low birth weight, any postnatal injury to the frontal regions of the brain, um, difficulty during pregnancy, alcohol, tobacco, exposure, high body level, or high body level lead level or high body lead levels could all impair brain development in utero. Um, all these will kind of lead to dysfunction of dopaminergic activity in the prefrontal cortex or dysfunction of adrenergic activity in the locus ruleus. These lead to altered neuron activity in cortical regions, which are involved in attention, impulse control, and stimulus integration. And from that, you get ADHD. Below that, it lists the two main subtypes I talked about. And to the right and left of these in the green boxes are a lot of the signs and symptoms I went over with a moment ago. When you have ADHD, you have increased risk for future substance abuse, risky behaviors, or problems in school. And finally, at the bottom of this slide is some of the DSM-5 criteria that must be met that I went over just a few moments ago as well. Let me see if I can. So next slide, again, this shows the pathogenesis of ADHD on the left, genetic factors, again, listed as the most important factor, and you have the different genetic factors there. Environmental factors play a role as well, but also uh, factors going on in the brain itself, circadian system imbalance, neurotransmission imbalance, uh, neuroinflammation, or altered neural viability all play a part and they come together and lead to ADHD. And comorbid conditions, which often exist, can uh, potentiate ADHD and ADHD could potentiate those in turn. So just wanted to point that out. Prevalence of ADHD, um, currently estimated um, in the US, this is this part, our chart kind of shows um, number in millions of children between ages three and 17 who've ever had the diagnosis. And as you can see from 2003 to kind of mo more recent years, the, the number of children in that age group with it have gone up. So the prevalence is increasing, went from 4.4 million to most recently uh, 6 million or in the sixes. Some comorbidities that often occur with ADHD, nearly two out of three children have at least one other condition. 45% uh, have some type of learning disorder. And this bar chart will show a lot of the more common ones. Um, about two thirds will have any mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. Uh, about half of these children will have a, a behavior or conduct problem. About a third will have anxiety. 
about a sixth will have depression, about a seventh autism, and 1% Tourette's. So these are some of the most common ones. This slide shows how ADHD affects uh, people across their lifespan. Um, and these um, kind of squares, these colored squares in the middle show the different age groups that you could fall into and some of the common problems you get as you age from children to adulthood. So when you're in preschool or school age, most of the issues you come across with ADHD are kind of related with child care issues, family relationships, or social skills. And then as you get into adolescent age, uh, self-esteem issues could come into play. Again, family relationships, but now social skills like dating and peer acceptance become a problem. Uh, life management skills can become a problem, such as time management, organization, learning to drive, self-advocacy. Uh, teenagers could possibly have substance abuse and untreated ADHD. As you get into adulthood, uh, parenting skills become a, a concern, uh, partner relationships, again, social skills and life management. Um, you have like time management, driving, managing finances, household management, and also antisocial behavior such as substance abuse and crime could become a problem in untreated ADHD. So why do we treat? Um, first off, there's a tremendously strong evidence base that shows treatment for ADHD is not only safe and effective, but we went over some of the negative consequences of ADHD going untreated in the previous slide. When you treat ADHD, you decrease a lot of these core symptoms and minimization of these over time is likely linked with improved functional status. And treatment of this can alter the course of other access one or access two disorders, which could be comorbid. A lot of the impairments we see in children are delays in independent functioning. Uh, kids may behave younger than their peers. Mild delays in language, motor skills, or social development, which are not part of ADHD, but they often co-occur. Uh, these kids tend to have a low frustration tolerance. Um, they have difficulty controlling emotions. They can have some wild mood swings. The kids are at risk of academic failure or delay. They have driving problems, which is due to kind of focus and concentration. Difficulty with peers and social situations. Uh, risk of sexual behavior, risky sexual behavior anyway, and risk of substance abuse. And there may be more severe negative behaviors with coexisting conditions, such as oppositional defiant or conduct disorder. Impairments we see in adulthood, first off, more than 75% of children with ADHD continue to experience significant symptoms into adulthood. A lot of these folks will have procrastination, chaos in their life and their relationships. They could have difficulty organizing. They could be late or tardy often difficulty reading and remembering things or forgetting tasks or appointments. Learning problems can lead to lower education or income, more job changes, sick leave, less employed. Life expectancy is likely reduced by young adulthood in ADHD. And this could be due to accidental or self-inflicted injuries. Um, there's an increased suicide risk in these folks. They're more likely to be involved with violent crimes, uh, display reactive aggression or intimate partner violence. Uh, they, they're arrested more, divorced more, could have more social problems, more driving accidents, teenage pregnancies, and just overall higher health costs, including mental health costs. So some of the screeners we use to assess for ADHD, I, I have a, quite a few listed here. I, can't get to, I can't get into all of them individually. Um, the Winder Utah at the bottom of this page is one I'm pretty familiar with. I use it quite often in my outpatient clinics. Um, some skills we use, uh, the first one is the Vanderbilt assessment scale. I have used this one personally as well. It's 150 questions, a parent and a teacher each fill parts of it out. It assesses symptoms, performance, academics, classroom behavior, and it's a um, four-point Likert scale from zero never to three very often, and then you get an average score. 
Um, there's also others like the Connors is a good one. And I have some more listed here. I can't get into the details of each. There's interviews and continuous performance tests we use to assess for ADHD. Uh, a standard clinical interview would just be a, a detailed kind of inquiry into their current status, their, their history of symptoms, any psychiatric comorbidities they have, the course of treatments they may or may not have had, any specific measured therapy they had. You have the case ads, kitty schedule for affective disorder and schizophrenia. It's a widely used tool that is used to diagnose, diagnose affective disorders early, such as depression, bipolar anxiety, but can be used for ADHD as well. Um, you have the DISC, the Diagnostic Interview Schedule for Children, a Connor CPT, which stands for Continuous Performance Test. It's basically a game. Uh, the kids will play on a computer. A, a letter will appear for a quarter of a second, and then the, the person taking the test has to hit the space bar when they see the letter, except if it's an X. So by doing this, they measure uh, performance aspects like vigilance, response inhibition, signal detection. You have visual and auditory performance tests kind of in the same vein. Um, you have a test of variables of attention, the TOVA, and this was described as 21.6 minutes long. It's a simple and boring video game. So you can see how ADHD may become um, kind of displayed when a, a child is taking this. A national parent survey from 2016 found that only about three and four US children between two and 17 with current ADHD were receiving treatment, 62% were getting uh, medications and 40% were receiving behavior therapy. Altogether, 77% uh, were receiving some kind of treatment and of these folks that were getting treated, 30% were, were with meds alone, 15 were getting behavior treatment alone about 32 were receiving both uh, medication and behavior treatment. 23% were receiving neither meds nor uh, behavior treatment. They weren't getting anything. CDC treatment guidelines for ADHD can include behavior therapy and medication for children six and older. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends behavior therapy and meds, preferably both together. If the child's under six, uh, behavior therapy is recommended as the first line. And just keep in mind that if a provider implements pharmacotherapy, there must also be a plan for psychosocial support, which could be parent education, psychotherapy, or 504 IEP services. Some keys of behavior therapy. Um, you wanna be consistent. You wanna use positive reinforcement with the kids. You wanna teach problem solving, communication skills, self-advocacy skills. Children, especially teenage age children should be involved as respected members of the planning and treatment teams. Certain classroom accommodations in most cases are minor adjustments to the environment. A lot of the children can be taught in a normal classroom. Some may require special education services and may require special placement outside the classroom. Um, you have 504 IEP services here for that. With behavior therapy and parent training, um, experts recommend that healthcare providers refer parents of children younger than 12 for training in behavior therapy. For children younger than six, parent training and behavior management should be tried before trying any ADHD medication. So what these parents can typically expect in this uh, behavior therapy training. They'll attend eight to 16 sessions with the therapist where they'll learn strategies to help their kid. Um, the sessions could be individual families or groups of families. The therapist will meet regularly with the family. Uh, they'll kind of monitor and provide support. And then in between the sessions, the parents will use these skills they learn from the therapist with their kids. And just keep in mind, young children aren't mature enough to change their own behavior without their parents' help, which is why this is kind of a key uh, piece of the puzzle in many cases. So some traditional um, pharmacotherapy for ADHD. This slide shows uh, the mechanism of action of methylphenidate, um, which is a non-competitive reuptake blocker of dopamine and noradrenaline. 
So in this photo, you can see some presynaptic neurons up there, one for norepinephrine, one for dopamine, kind of releasing their contents into the synaptic cleft. And you may have um, unsatisfactory receptor activation in the postsynaptic neurons. So this medication will block reuptake. It'll kind of flood the cleft with ex extra neurotransmitters and you'll get better potentiation of response downstream. There's many trade names and delivery methods of this medication. Uh, Ritalin is a, is a commonly used one and it'll have a three to five hour duration of action and it's got many forms. You can get sustained release for a longer duration, long acting, extended release eight hours. Concerta is another form. It's got 10 to 12 hour duration of action. <clears throat> Jornay PM. Um, this is one you take at night. It has a 10 hour delay onset of action. So it'll kick in the next morning. You have Focalin, you have extended release or extended release formulation with a longer duration of action for Focalin. Daytrana is a patch. If uh, some folks want to use that method, it's got a 10 to 12 hour duration. It comes in chewable forms. It comes in liquid forms. As you can see, Quillivant and Quillichu. Uh, Code Templa is a rapid disintegrating tablet with a 10 to 12 hour duration of action. And all of these are FDA approved for treatment of ADHD in children and teens. The next slide shows the mechanism of action of amphetamine. And this modifies the action of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. This will induce vesicular dopamine release. It will bind to VMAT and inhibit and re reverse that. It will compete for dopamine with the or compete with dopamine for the dopamine transporter, the DAT. It will bind to this DAT transporter and reverse and internalize it. Also, this can inhibit monoamine oxidase, which breaks down dopamine. All of this leads to increased synaptic dopamine and better uh, receptor saturation. Some non-stimulant medications. All non-stimulants are broadly classified as either monoamine reuptake inhibitors, such as atomoxetine, receptor modulators, such as guanfacine or clonidine and multimodal agents such as veloxazine, medication I'm gonna talk about today. What is a multimodal agent? Um, it's a drug that will combine transporter modulation or in inhibition with receptor modulation. And a lot of the targets would be norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Some things to note, um, Adamoxetine is FDA approved for ADHD treatment in kids. Guanfacine is only FDA approved for uh, ages six to 17. And adamoxetine is also approved for adults, I'm sorry. Clonidine is only FDA approved in its extended release formulation. This slide will show the mechanism of action of adamoxetine. Um, on the left, a uh, patient with ADHD will have, as you can see in the postsynaptic neuron, underactivation of alpha adrenergic receptors, and that's leading to a lot of the inattentive symptoms of ADHD. So adamoxetine will again block reuptake of this, um, which you'll see on the right with kind of the blue neuron. A lot of those receptors have a red X on them. They're blocked out. It's flooding the cleft with increased norepinephrine. You have increased activation of the alpha adrenergic receptors, and that's leading to decreased symptoms of inattentiveness or ADHD. Uh, veloxazine is <clears throat> the drug I wanted to discuss today, trade named Quilbury. This was first described in 1972 and marketed as an antidepressant in Europe in 1974. It wasn't marketed in, in the US at that time. The medication was discontinued about 20 years ago due to commercial reasons. And in April of 2021, it was repurposed for treatment of ADHD and reintroduced in the US. It got FDA approved for treatment of ADHD in children and adolescents. This medicine acts as a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor and has affinities for the norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin transporters which is believed to be responsible for its therapeutic effectiveness in the treatment of ADHD and also things like depression. As such, it's, it has no known misuse liability. It's not a controlled substance. 
dosing and formulations of veloxazine. This is available for ADHD in 100, 150, and 200 milligram in extended release and instant release capsules. Patients ages six to 11, the suggested dose is 100 milligrams daily, and you can increase by 100 milligrams each week until you reach a max of 400. <clears throat> in patients 12 to 17, suggested dose is 200 milligrams daily to start, and you can increase by 200 per week until you hit the 400 max. Adults, again, you start at 200, and you could titrate by 200 a week, but their max dose is higher at 600 daily. For renal dosing, any patient with um, estimated GFR less than 30, you wanna reduce this dose. You wanna start at 100 and go up slower, maybe by 50 to 100 a day in a lower max dose of 200. The metabolism is primarily via the cytochrome P450 enzyme, uh, CYP2D6, and the glucuronyl transferases listed there. So you should uh, take care when you co-administer this drug with others that are also metabolized by these. With that, it's contraindicated with linezolid, duloxetine, MAO inhibitors, among others. This is mainly renally eliminated. About 90% of it is excreted within 24 hours in the urine, about 1% in the feces. Um, the elimination half-life of the instant release veloxazine is two to five hours and extended release veloxazine is about seven hours, hence why it's the extended release has a contraindication in folks with GFR less than 30. Some common side effects of this medicine, increased heart rate and blood pressure, which is through norepinephrine level increases in the brain. So it's contraindicated in patients with hypertension or tachycardia. You could get insomnia, somnolence, headache, fatigue, nausea, anorexia, uh, xerostomia, which is dry mouth, upper respiratory infection, abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, irritability, tachycardia, dizziness, fever, GERD, weight loss, among, among others. The more serious side effects are suicidality and mania. So this medicine is contraindicated in folks that have bipolar or at risk of uh, suicide, it carries a black box warning for the increased suicidality in peds. So something to be mindful of, certainly. Any monitoring parameters, they recommend getting a creatinine level at the baseline and get the blood pressure and heart rate at baseline as well. And anytime after you increase doses, also monitor for signs of suicidality, any clinical worsening or unusual behavior changes while the patient's on the medicine. So I was gonna talk about a couple of um, studies they did regarding veloxazine. And this is the, the first medicine, the first non-stimulant that kind of got FDA approved for ADHD in the past 20 years. So the study, the first one I wanna look at, the title is, is right here, it's kind of long, Executive Functioning Outcome of Treatment with Veloxazine Extended Release Capsules in Children and Adolescents with ADHD. This was a post hoc analysis of four randomized clinical trials. The authors are listed below that. And just a disclaimer, this study was funded by Supernis Pharmaceuticals and several of those authors are employees. So take that for what it's worth. Again, this was post hoc analysis. It looked at data from four pivotal phase three trials in ADHD in children and adolescents, and it was treated with non-stimulant veloxazine. The study evaluated the effect of the extended release capsules on executive functioning deficits. The data from the studies used to evaluate change from baseline in the Connors third edition parent short form executive functioning scale. The scale's four point Likert scale, it assesses things like inattention, hyperactivity or impulsivity, learning problems that children have, executive function, any defiance or aggression and peer relations. So the symptoms were assessed using that scale and responders were defined as having a greater than 50% reduction in total score by week six. Inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria for this study. 
First off, the subjects had to have a diagnosis of ADHD based on DSM-5 criteria that I went over with you guys a little bit ago. They confirmed it using the mini international neuropsychiatric interview for children and adolescents. They had to have an ADHD rating score, uh, to five total score of greater than or equal to 28 and a clinical global impression severity of illness score, at least four. They were excluded if they had any major psychiatric disorder and this excluded oppositional defiant or major depressive disorder. If the patient was free of um, major depression episodes within the past six months, they were also excluded if they had a, a major neurological disorder, any allergy to veloxazine, suicidal ideation, history of seizures, or other si significant systemic disease. So the subjects in these studies returned weekly for efficacy and safety assessments. The ADHD um, rating scale five was assessed at screening baseline and post baseline weekly visits until the end of study or any early termination. So participation in these studies, um, like I said, it was four double blind, three arm parallel group placebo controlled phase three clinical trials of veloxazine extended release. And table one here will show the four studies um, and it'll show the, the age and years of the children. So there were two studies where the kids were six to 11 and two studies where they were 12 to 17. Uh, to the right of the age and years, you have the doses that the, the participants received. So in one study, the, the children six to 11 either got 100 or 200 milligrams. Uh, in another, they got either 200 or 400. And likewise, the 12 to 17 group either got 200, 400, or 400, 600. Uh, the length of the studies is shown to the right of that. They were all six to eight weeks. The total number of participants is the end number, and the number of participants receiving treatment versus placebo is on the far right. So the, the second table here shows that there was a statistically significant improvement and the change from baseline of the Connors 3 executive function T-score, and it was observed in all the doses pulled, kind of the entire treatment group versus placebo, uh, the T-score change was minus 2.7, and the P-value uh, showed significance, it was 0 0.0002. And the table will actually break down the number of participants um, with the different doses and including the placebo group the placebo group itself showed a statistically uh, significant improvement as well. You can see at baseline, the Connors third edition uh, executive function score was 76. And at end of study, it went down to 69. Uh, the 100 milligram showed improvement from baseline of score 79 to end of study 66. The 200 improved 76 to 66, uh, 400 improved. 75 to 66, and the 600 also improved from 71 to 66. The analysis initially for this, uh, over 1,000 subjects, 1,154. When considering the executive functioning deficit or ADHD symptom responders, and again, it was those that had an ADHD rating scale five score improvement, at least 50% um, from baseline to week six, or decrease in the Connors uh, score, the executive function score from over 70 to less than 65. Response rates were over half, 52.5% for veloxazine extended release and 35.4 for placebo as well. Statistically significant improvements were observed with veloxazine extended release versus placebo as shown by the P-score there. Uh, 0 0.0002. The number needed to treat was found to be 5.8. And a low number needed to treat is typically indicative of a clinically meaningful effect. This table will show the association between the Connors third edition executive functioning and ADHD rating scale change. Um, positive scores on this chart will denote a, an improvement. Uh, the correlation between magnitude of executive function response and magnitude of ADHD symptom response was 0 0.47, and that was found to be significant by the low P score there, 0 0.0001. Uh, 
many of the participants had a substantial improvement in both. So the very upper right quadrant of this um, table will, will show that many had in, uh, scores that improved over 20 points, which is two standard deviations. So looking at this table, the x-axis will have the change in baseline from ADHD uh, rating scale score at week six, and you see the zero on the x-axis, anything to the right of that to be positive. On the y-axis, you have the change in the Connors third edition executive function T-score. Uh, the zero is about a third of the way up on the y-axis and anything above that's positive. So most of the data or most of the points are in the positive area of improvement for both. Some limitations or areas of discussion with this particular study, um, it used a behavioral measure of executive function deficits. The results may not generalize to neuropsychological measurements of executive functioning. This was the first study evaluating the effect on veloxazine on executive function deficits. The results show the difference on the standardized mean difference scale was actually small. So about 40% of patients did have clinically significant improvements. A second study I wanted to look at today was translating um, ADHD rating scale five and Weiss functional impairment rating scale parent effectiveness scores, uh, translating these two scores into clinical global impressions, uh, clinical significance levels in four randomized trials of veloxazine extended release in children with ADHD. The authors of this study are underlined below. And again, a disclaimer with this study, it was fully sponsored by Supernus Pharmaceuticals. The study sponsor was fully involved in all aspects of this work, uh, data analysis, interpretation, and article drafting and editing. So something to just be mindful of. This study is going to look pretty familiar because it was a post hoc analysis and it looked at the same four uh, trials in ADHD that we just looked at. Um, four studies again, two children ages six to 11, two in ages 12 to 17. All these were, were randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, multi center, parallel group studies like I went over with. This study evaluated the ADHD rating scale score and Weiss functional impairment rating scale parent form assessments of symptom severity. And it did so by linking these with cognitive global impression scales at baseline and the end of the study. So these CGI scales, they measure symptom severity, which would be CGIS for symptom severity or change from baseline using CGI improvement, which would be CGII. Equi percentile linking will convert scores on one scale to scores on another by linking the scores with the same percentile rank. Uh, this study compared scores from two comprehensive assessments that evaluated ADHD symptom severity and functional impairment with the corresponding uh, cognitive global impression symptom severity or improvement scores. And again, linking them based on percentile rank. Table one will show the studies and participants and it'll look awfully familiar because it's the same four studies from the other um, study. Again, the number of participants and um, each, there's two studies for children six to 11. Uh, the studies are listed underneath that, uh, P301 and P303. It'll show the population, um, which ones got treatment and which ones got placebo. It'll show the various doses that the, the, the participants received, the length of study an end of study assessment. And again, it's the same four studies, so the data is identical. Methods, inclusion and exclusion criteria were the same. Uh, you had to have ADHD measured through DSM criteria. They confirmed it with a mini kid uh, interview. You had to have an ADHD rating scale score of 28 at, at screening and at least a uh, CGI uh, symptom severity score of four. These people needed a seven day drug washout period before beginning. So parents completed the Weiss functional impairment rating skill parent form at baseline and at end of study. The exclusion criteria were the same, major psychiatric disorders, not oppositional defined or MDD, uh, major neurologic disorders or seizure disorders. 
So these participants were randomized into one of three groups. They got either placebo or one of the two doses. Uh, again, the children, this is the same study. So the children got either 100, 200 milligram doses in one study or 200, 400 in the other. And likewise, adolescents got larger doses, 200, 400 or 400, 600 in the other study. Initial doses were 100 in children and 200 in adolescents. And they titrated these up weekly by either 100 or 200 respectively until they hit a fixed target dose, which they kept in for five weeks or until the end of study. The primary endpoint was the change in baseline and ADHD rating skill five total score. And secondary endpoints were mean cognitive global impression uh, improvement score at end of study, and also the change in baseline in the WISE functional impairment total score. These cognitive global impression scales are two single item standalone assessments, which are of a clinician's view of a patient's overall functioning. Uh, both scales, the symptom severity and the improvement are both seven point Likert scales, which start at one, which would be normal or not at all ill, or very much improved respectively to a seven, which would be extremely ill or very much worse. In each study, these were administered at baseline. Uh, well, the, the symptom severity one was administered at baseline and the um, improvement was administered weekly until the end of study. The WISE functional impairment rating scale is assessed, um, it assesses functional impairment in children and adolescents by quantifying the degree to which their symptoms affect their daily activities over the past month. Uh, the parent does the rating and they look at six domains, family, school and learning, life skills, child self-concept, social activities and risky activities. It's a, there's 50 items on the test. It's a four point Likert from zero, which is never, not at all, all the way up to three, which is very often or very much. And you get a total average score at the end. In all four trials, this was administered at baseline and end of study to see if there was any change. Again, this used equipercentile linking. It linked scores on the ADHD rating scale and the WISE functional impairment with their corresponding um, CGI that had the same percentile rank and it's did that to translate between these two different assessments. Um, the study created link functions between two time points, baseline and end of study. And again, it used equi percentile ranks to, to match one scale to the other based on their rank. Uh, the scores were expanded to encompass a range. And here's just an example, CGI symptom severity of four is represented by 3.5 to 4.4. Confidence interval was 95%. And subjects with a baseline score and at least one post-randomization score were included in the analysis. The results found a two-sided Fisher's exact test compared the number of subjects treated with fluoxazine versus placebo, achieving clinically meaningful improvements at end of study. And it found that significantly more children treated with the veloxazine, 47%, received a um, improvement evaluation of very of much improved or very much improved compared with placebo, which was 32%. That was found to be significant. Uh, found that more children treated with veloxazine, 20%, were evaluated at end of study as very much improved versus placebo, which had 11.9%, and that was significant as well. Significantly more adolescents treated with veloxazine, 51% were evaluated as very much improved at end of study compared with placebo, which was 32%. And more adolescents treated with veloxazine were evaluated as very much improved at the end of study, 24% compared with placebo, 15.5%. And that P-score was 0 0.05, so right at the cutoff. This table just shows the four groups, um, children and adolescents, and how they compared um, placebo versus treatment. So the dark bar shows the participants who received veloxazine extended release, and the white bar shows the placebo group. On the x-axis, you have um, their improvement kind of degree, and the y-axis is the percent of subjects that um, received that that degree of improvement. And 
if you look at the bars, you'll see that veloxacine groups outperform placebo groups in all four kind of levels of improvement. This table show, or this, this chart shows ADHD rating scale five and cognitive global impression symptom severity scores, how they're linked together. So the x-axis will have the ADHD rating scale total score at baseline. And as it goes across the x-axis from 10 to 55, that's kind of how many symptoms you're showing, the higher score you have on here, kind of more symptoms. And it will link that with the cognitive global impression symptom severity on the y-axis. So it'll just show that as your ADHD rating skills score goes up, it's associated with um, more prominent symptoms on the y-axis. And this has four different lines on it for the, the different participants, the two adolescent groups and the two children groups, and they're all behaving similarly um, as far as converting one score to the other score. This shows the absolute change from baseline in the ADHD rating scale score with the uh, cognitive global impressions improvement scale. So on the x-axis, the zero is kind of like midway um, across it. So anything to the left of the zero would be a drop in the ADHD rating scale score. So minus five, minus 15, minus 25. On the, on the y scale, you have um, kind of symptoms. Halfway up, you have no change, which would be zero. And going up, it have symptoms worsening and going down, symptom improvement. So anything in the left lower quadrant will show patients that improved in both. And this shows how a change in the ADHD score corresponds with um, the improvement score. So the larger change on the x-axis, you'll usually have a more pronounced improvement in symptoms on the y-axis. This shows the percent change. Um, and again, it, it's behaving exactly the same as the other chart. Anything in the left lower quadrant is positive. So uh, improvement in the ADHD rating skill score uh, of various amounts will correspond with um, improvements and symptoms that are more noticeable. So like a large drop in ADHD rating skill on the x-axis will be very much approved on the improvement scale, the CGI scale. This shows the Weiss functional impairment scale linked with um, the CGI symptom severity. And it just shows that the, high, the higher Weiss functional impairment scale on the x-axis um, indicating worse function will be translated into more marked um, symptom severity on the y-axis. And this shows children and adolescents behaving kind of in the same pattern. This will show the improvement length, absolute change from baseline in the Weiss um, and how it corresponds with um, symptom improvement on the y-axis. So if you look at the x-axis, it kind of got the dotted lines and that would be the zero. So anything going to the left of the dotted line would be improvement in the Weiss. And however much improvement you get from say a half a point all the way up to two and a half points, would correspond with um, improvement on the cognitive global impression scale. And it just takes one and links it to the other. So you could kind of see um, what these actual mean. Like if you get a one point improvement, what you could expect to see on the symptom severity or symptom improvement on the y-axis. And children and adolescents behave um, kind of in the same fashion on this scale as well. And this next table is kind of the same thing. It just shows percent change. And again, anything in the left lower quadrant would be the percent change, changes are positive. You have a, a lower Weiss functional impairment scale and you have um, cognitive global impression improvement is very much improved, you know, the more positive you get, or in this case, it'd be the left lower quadrant. So it'd be to the left and down. Some discussion with this study, and I wanted to include this study because it, kind of takes uh, rating improvement on these uh, skills we use to assess for ADHD after treatment and kind of translating that and what you could expect to see with actual symptom severity or symptom improvement. So this study could provide a benchmark for translating scores into clinically meaningful results. 
it should be useful for physicians um, trying to understand a treatment's potential impact on their patients by displaying what improvement on one rating scale can translate into on symptom severity or symptom improvement, like I just said, uh, how this pertains to potential prescribers. Fluoxazine showed improvement in skills commonly used to assess ADHD symptom severity, and it linked them with other skills to show how that improvement in one skill might translate to clinical results. Some limitations I thought I wanted to, to kind of shine light on. Neither of these studies um, looked at the cost of treatment, obviously. That's what most people take into account. Um, it didn't compare cost of veloxazine with, with some of the tried and true medications that are already on market. Another thing was the length of these studies. They were six to eight weeks long. A lot of the time with non-stimulant options of ADHD, patients will have improvement at six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, maybe even longer. So I thought maybe a longer study might um, show some different results. These studies both showed high placebo response rates. I think it was like in the low 30s for both um, with significant improvement, which is kind of a common phenomenon with ADHD treatment studies. And overall, these studies showed that this treatment, veloxazine, has a modest effect, but it is clinically significant. And it can be another treatment option for uh, patients or parents of patients who want to start treatment, but might be hesitant to start with a stimulant medication. So my inspiration for choosing this topic real quick, this is a photo of me, um, my girlfriend back home and her two children. That little girl, you might recognize me, I'm in the pink shirt. That little girl climbing on my shoulders, her name's Kaya. She's nine years old. And about a year and a half ago, me and mom were kind of working through uh, getting her worked up for ADHD. We noticed some things she was having trouble with at home and in school. And we sat down, we did the uh, Vanderbilt assessment scale together. And she did other things as well. But while kind of going through that with her and working through the diagnosis process, I thought, hey, I'm gonna look into this a little more and learn about ADHD. Here's a photo of her again from last month at her school's Christmas recital. Um, it's the concert they put on, it's the choir concert. Resources I used putting this together listed here. And that's the end.